on Motor Week this week, Mike Rutherford, the first man in the world to put a deposit on a new Beetle, actually drives one for us. Ginny Buckley discovers the expensive delights of the delicious Mercedes CLK, while Howard Stapleford tries to come to terms with the interior of the new family estate from Toyota. Think Mercedes, and you think quality, refinement, safety. You don't think sexy and sporty. Unless, of course, your Mercedes has the magical letters CLK on the back. They tell you you're in a Mercedes-Benz sports car, and you're in for the kind of driving experience you won't forget in a hurry. The arrival of the Mercedes SLK started it all off. It became a huge hit, with all available cars selling instantly and the order books full until the end of the decade. The designers in Stuttgart clearly liked the new, sleek, sexy Mercedes image and decided to work their magic on a coupe. No more unadventurous coupes, designed for the terminally sensible and boring. Say hello instead to the CLK. Sporty, smooth and sleek. A handsome car resembling a thoroughbred racehorse with a range of engines under the bonnet that could perform like a Grand National winner. The CLK range comes with a choice of three engines. There's a two-litre entry-level model, a rather sporty 230 compressor, and if it's pure power that you're after, you can give this 3.2-litre V6 a try. Now, Mercedes are keen to convince you that this is a car designed not for the wrinklies amongst us, but for the young, or at the very least, the young at heart. The press pack waxes lyrically about the youthful design and the range of youthful colours. But in reality, I doubt whether many of today's youth would have enough spare change in their pockets to be able to afford one of them. Prices start at just under £27,000. And this, the top of the range 320 Elegance, is £36,600 on the road. Ah, but let's not forget all those little extras. There's metallic paint. That'll be £651.20, please. The very finest leather upholstery. £1,790.81. Get a bit of light into your journey with an electric sunroof. £1,254.61. Maybe you could treat your passenger to an electric seat just like yours. It'll be £724.70. There's a memory to remember your very own seat setting at £720. And why not make your journey even more comfortable? Invest in a pair of orthopaedic seats, £250 and £94 each. Oh, I could go on, as there are around £8,000 worth of extras on this model pushing the final price to £45,000. Hmm. With all those university loans to pay off, the youth of today have got absolutely no chance. But lucky for me, I have the car and I have the key. The minute you open the door to the CLK, you're struck by a sense of luxury and quality. It may be sexy and sleek, but all the traditional Mercedes values are still there. Inside, it's understated, wonderfully crafted and incredibly refined. Everything is positioned perfectly, sensibly and ergonomically. This interior has been designed by people who realise that the journey is every bit as important as the arrival. As you slip the five-speed auto into drive and gently sail away, you could be floating on air. The orthopaedic seats cushion you. The sport suspension holds you firm over every bump and lump. You simply cruise, letting the cares of the day slip away and enjoying the experience of being behind the wheel. Now this may be a large car with more room than backseat passengers normally get and take a look, an absolutely huge boot for a coupe. But behind the wheel, it really doesn't feel that large. The CLK is involving to drive, and you can have plenty of fun in it. It may have an almost regal quality about it, but it doesn't mind if you want to throw it into a few corners. It's always ready and more than willing to have a go. Under the bonnet, the V6 is as smooth as silk. 
It kicks back beautifully, launching the CLK from 0 to 60 in 7.5 seconds with a top speed of 150 miles per hour. The five-speed automatic gearbox responds instantly, almost as if it understands what it is that you want it to do. And that's because it really does understand. The electronic system registers every movement on the accelerator pedal and it learns your driving style. Lots of short, sharp, fast movements on the pedal mean you have a sporty style and the gearbox responds accordingly. Just think, it won't matter anymore if your wife doesn't understand you because at least your gearbox will. Now that's just one of the many clever little gadgets and gizmos that start to make you think that, yes, it's a very, very expensive car, but you do get an awful lot for your money. There's ABS with brake assist, acceleration skid control, and how about an electronic stability programme? Long words, and they all sound very technical, but what they mean is that if you fail to react quick enough in an emergency, the car will take over and do the job for you. But of all the gadgets that are packed onto this car, my favourite has to be the Parktronic system. All around this rather large vehicle are little sensors that watch where you're going and let you know when you get too close to anything. But even something that's packed with so many wondrous gadgets has to have a few bad points. The CLK's heater. Well, it certainly heats up all right, but there doesn't seem to be any setting between roasting hot and rather cold. The windscreen wiper. Well, there's just one of them and it's extremely large. It squeaks a lot, doesn't work very well and sounds as if it's about to take off at any second. And finally, the doors. Boy, do they need a good slam to close them properly. And I mean, a good slam. The Mercedes CLK is a wonderful car. OK, it's very expensive and it is also quite elitist. But it's still extremely exciting to drive and it's just so luxurious. There's an added bonus as well. Wherever you go in the CLK, you travel in air condition, opulence and splendour, feeling extremely nouveau riche. Until that is, you arrive at home and you realise that the car costs more to buy than your house did. Well, we've brought you news from the Detroit show, from the Tokyo show, from the London show, from the Paris show, from the Frankfurt show. And this week, we go to the world's car capital, Los Angeles, California. Well, the world's press turns up for the media day at the LA Auto Show and Jaguar get a chance to show exactly what they can do on the world stage. And this is what they can do. This is the General Motors EV1, electric vehicle one, the car that's going to save the planet. And just look at all those crowds flocking to see it. Now the Honda JVX is an alternative fueled vehicle in a completely different league. If you didn't get a detailed look at this car two or three months ago when it made its world debut at the Tokyo Motor Show, just sit back and enjoy it right now. Forget about that ugly EV1, this is how environmentally friendly cars of the future should look. A new Land Rover? Well that's what the sign appears to say, doesn't it? But as you've probably gathered by now, this is in fact the Plymouth Prowler from the Chrysler Stable in a new, not so mellow yellow shade. Here's another of those Tokyo show cars that's now popping up around the world. It's called the Ecom, and as its appearance and name suggests, it's another one of those electric cars that we're supposed to be driving around in, in the very near future. Convertibles don't have bike racks, right? Or wrong. This clever accessory from Porsche means you can carry your two-wheeler above your Porsche Boxster. Only problem I have with this is, uh, well, if you've got a box star, why would you ever want to climb out of it and onto your push bike? Go on, take one last sad look at this. This is the Rolls-Royce stand at the LA Motor Show, and this is one of the last times you'll ever see this great British company flying the flag for Britain. Because very soon, Rolls-Royce will be flying the flag for Germany. Hello, what's this? Finally, finally, some atmosphere and excitement at the LA Motor Show. Or is it? Well, actually, this is the new fully loaded Lexus LX470. 
No, your eyes do not deceive you. This is the Tabasco Wrangler from Jeep, complete with chili tire tread. No, I'm not joking. This was one of the hottest cars at the LA show. Get it? Hot? Never mind. Now, you thought this was a Honda NSX, didn't you? Well, in fact, it's an Acura, a sports car that is probably being discounted more heavily than any other car in the world right now. I saw one of these on sale in LA with a $17,000, about 12,000 pounds discount off the official list price. Talk about one extreme to the other. On my way home from LA, I popped in on the Detroit show where I found the Jaguar stand stocked with plenty of cars and an airplane. How they got the thing into the Kobo Center in downtown Detroit, I just do not know, but I do know that the plane is on sale, complete with Jag upholstery and instrumentation. And the word is, if you have to ask how much it is, you can't afford it. The name of the company that makes this car is almost a palindrome for a toy yacht. Turn it the other way around and you've got a Toyota. We'll start with the good news. This is the top of the range CDX 2 litre estate. Now normally estates, I think, are really ugly. They're sort of saloons with a box tacked on the back. But this one is gorgeous in comparison to most of its rivals, which is a surprise because it's been designed by a Toyota Pan-European committee. Now normally, as we know, committees give us camels, but not in this case. Look at this beautifully sculpted bonnet here, smoking windows and a backside that's positively pert with these beautiful wrap round large lamps that make the estate version of the Avensis look like it was properly designed from scratch. Very attractive, full mark so far. Unfortunately, exhausted by their excellent efforts outside, this talented design team obviously took a break whilst Steve Boring Davis designed the interior. Look at this, acres of dark grey plastic, last seen on John Major's spitting image puppet. Create an atmosphere with all the appeal of a wet winter's sky over Skegness. And look, hard grey leather seats add to the atmosphere of despondence. And those sassy smoking windows on the outside just add to the gloom on the inside. However, I believe that other interior colours are available. The Avensis is now amongst us so that the boring old Carina E no longer needs to be. It's being phased out this year. Meanwhile, Toyota have high hopes indeed for their new Rose. It's aimed at the upper-medium sector of the market, wants to be a big player on the fleet buyers list, and is supposed to appeal strongly to young families as well. The engines have been reworked to be more responsive than the Carina E. They vary from a 1.6-litre 16-valve lean burn through a 1.8 version to 2 litres. There's also a 2-litre turbo diesel engine with electronic fuel injection, drive-by-wire throttle and an intercooler. I wish they'd sent me that one to try. Acceleration has been improved at lower engine speeds in the Avensis, and there's roughly 3% better fuel efficiency over all of the four new models. Meanwhile, back in the driver's seat. It's a perfectly pleasant and easy car to drive. The seats are very comfortable, they wrap round you extremely snugly, and unlike in a lot of cars, the headrests actually come forward and rest your head. And one thing I particularly like is the view through the large rear quarter windows. Now the cheapest version of the Avensis is the S grade, but even that comes pretty loaded with things like powered front windows and mirrors, adjustable steering column remote, central locking and an immobiliser. Now this is the top of the range as I said earlier, so this one comes with a rather nice electric sunroof. It also has wood trim that clashes horribly with all the grey plastic. An extremely attractive CD tape and radio, along with a truly awful audio remote control. I mean, look at this little stubby thing down here. You need the dexterity of a magician to fumble your way around here to find anything useful. And then why bother? Because the remote controls are so handily situated, 
near the actual controls. You know me, I like a gadget, but only if they're actually useful. In the bad old days, it was how fast a car could go and how quickly it could get you there that sold cars. Today, it's how many mod cons come as standard, and of course, how safe is my family going to be? Well, the Avensis does pretty well in these departments. Toyota claims that this has the best safety features in its class. Driver and passenger airbags, of course. Front seat side airbags are standard too. What's more, the front airbags are larger than in the Carina. Anti-lock brakes are standard, better seat belt mechanisms, and reinforced rear seat backs to stop flying luggage becoming a pain in the back. All good stuff. Talking of luggage, I've decided to stop here to show you how flexible things are in the back. Oh, and by the way, these luggage rails are standard on the CDX. For a start, there's a deceptively large amount of space in the back here, and that's because it's opened out at the sides behind the rear wheel arches to give extra width. There are clasps in here to batten your luggage down, and this is rather neat too. Simple cover to hide your valuables that clips in the back, and that's also very easy to remove. A couple of levers there, and the whole thing, very light, just lifts out. And that's also true of this fabric luggage guard here. That simply unclasps too. Meanwhile, in the back seats, lots of space, good leg room down here because the front seats have been sculpted out to give you extra room for your knees. And there's great flexibility here too. Basically, these seats can be very simply pushed down. Oh, hello. And then the back seat just pops forward like that and the headrest comes out. Extra flexibility, extra length there, and the same on the other side. But before I show you that, there's a nice piece of storage space there. Put your drinks, a little few nibbles there. But otherwise, this seat does just the same. Clips, forward it goes. You take the backrest off, and then you've got acres of space. Rather clever. Overall, I like the design of this estate car, but it's not going to light any fires in the motoring world. It's a good machine, but its performance is as dull as the interior planes of plastic. The Aventa 2.0-litre CDX estate does 0-60 to in about 10 seconds, has a top speed of 125 miles an hour and an average fuel consumption of 33 mpg, and it costs just under £20,000. The bottom of the range S grade starts at 14,000. Now Toyota compares prices and specs with rivals like the Vectra, the Mondeo and the Peugeot 406 and the Avensis comes out on top quite easily. However, at the time I was road testing, the Avensis was in a higher insurance class than the others because Toyota hadn't got round to sending the assessors a car to assess. Now that's one drawback I'm sure they'll remedy straight away. You're witnessing a little bit of modern motoring history. Hundreds, possibly thousands of us media tarts attending the launch of the most intriguing car of the 1990s. And as day breaks here in the heart of the American Bible Belt, the cars you see here will probably end up in collections and museums around the world because they are in fact the first, the very first, new Beatles ever to venture out onto public roads anywhere in the world. Of course, there are plenty more where those come from. The New Beetle factory in Mexico is working overtime, churning out as many bugs as it possibly can, trying to satisfy demand in America, where sales start this spring. Then there's a little matter of building cars for Germany and 101 other markets around the globe too. Now, the Beetle will be such a late arrival in British showrooms for one very simple reason. Left-hand drive versions are the priority and are built first. Right hookers, the ones we want, will be made when the Mexicans get around to it. Like I say, 
They're promising to lay off the tequila and the tacos and start deliveries to the UK by early 1999. But don't hold your breath, I reckon they'll be later than that. As you can see, the front end of the new Beetle looks remarkably similar to the original, if you ignore those classy Porsche 911-like headlamps for a moment. And the car looks especially good in this magnificent metallic silver. But no matter what shade the car is, its side and rear views are absolutely spot on. But anybody who dares criticise the new Beetle's architecture is off their trolley. The hard to impress journalists from around the world are saying that, and so are the top designers who don't even work for VW but admire the new Beetle enormously. And most important of all, the ordinary men and women in the street loved this car when they saw it in and around Atlanta. It didn't matter whether they were rednecks and good old boys in pickup trucks or they were office girls in their cheap sports cars, they all fell in love with the new Beetle, male or female. And I have to say, so did I. The overall appearance gets a 10 out of 10. The interior is too lavishly equipped, I ask you, illuminated vanity mirrors in a Beetle, but most of it's very tastefully done and the solitary dial including the speedo, rev counter and fuel gauge is brilliantly simple and very, very well designed. Turn the ignition key and there's virtual silence. Remember the new Beetle is a Golf under the skin and that means a super quiet front mounted power pack. In fact, too quiet for my liking. The appeal of the original Beetle was that it sounded like your dad's Qualcast lawnmower. There's a bit of annoying wind noise from around the A-pillars when you're out on the road in the new Beetle, and driver vision ain't brilliant thanks to those thick A-pillars which stupidly have tweeters and speakers at the bottom to make them even thicker, about 10 inches thick in fact. Not a good idea. And while we're picking up on the Beetle's negative points, the rear headroom is an absolute joke. But the new Beetle's plus points outweigh the bad by about, well, 100 to 1. The Beetle isn't just making a comeback, it's doing it in style. The execution is phenomenally good. The car looks great in pictures, on motor show stands and on the road where it counts. It makes fellow drivers smile and wave. And like all Golfs, remember, I keep saying this, it's not, nothing more than a Golf under the skin. It drives superbly. Next week, exclusive and direct, all the atmosphere from the Geneva International Motor Show, the all-new Ford Escort, the new Clio, new 3 Series and many, many more covered in next week's Geneva Special Motor Week.